In 1997, a massive gray cloud of gas and smog settled over the ordinary town of Daleport, New England. Phone lines were cut off, and any attempts to enter the town were met with failure. There was a complete and total blackout of information coming in and out of Daleport. Whatever was occurring, it was anything but normal, and clashed with the town's easygoing and peaceful atmosphere. An anomalous event of this size and scale was impossible to miss, and naturally caught the attention of the SCP Foundation before it did the outside media, who would report on the mysterious occurrence and draw unnecessary amounts of attention to the town. The Foundation was lucky enough to maintain a hold over the situation little over three hours after it had begun, and they were already starting their usual cover-up story operations, keeping the situation in Daleport well away from the public eye. Still, they were unsure of what was occurring and what they were dealing with themselves. If they were going to get to the bottom of this mysterious smog covering an average New England town, they were going to be safe and have to play it resourcefully, as the SCP Foundation is known for doing. The status of Daleport's residents, whether they were alive or dead, was completely unknown, and so the Foundation began their rescue efforts. A containment perimeter surrounding the town was established, and relevant witnesses outside of the town were detained and amnesticized, with convincing cover stories already being deployed. For the Foundation, even an entire town undergoing an anomalous event was something they were well prepared to deal with, having handled similar situations multiple times over the decades. The Foundation began its research on Daleport by observing what exactly the cloud of smog covering the town was. The Foundation wasn't keen on sending its personnel, even the so-called disposable D-Class, to their death, so the first exploration into the cloud was carried out by an unmanned ground vehicle, operating under the callsign UGV-1. This unstoppable carrier was equipped with all the stops, including atmospheric sampling sensors, audio-video recording equipment, and an open-circuit biological sampling instrument, which contained skin tissue and several live brown rats whose reactions would indicate to the Foundation whether or not the smog was safe to be exposed to or not. The ground vehicle departed, and when it returned about a half hour later, it brought with it a whole host of data about the gas covering Daleport. As it turned out, the smog was composed of sulfur, nitrogen, and carbon oxides concentrated at a level where irritation would occur upon contact with humans, but it wasn't lethal. Neither was it anomalous, as the samples the vehicle carried in with it were unaffected in any anomalous manner. The video recording displayed a flat, empty wasteland inside the gas cluster, with little discernible features. After a certain point, radio communication with the vehicle became degraded, and the Foundation returned the carrier to the town's perimeter. As more resources and supplies arrived on location, the Foundation ramped up its research efforts. This time, two D-Class were sent into the gas cluster, both aboard another ground vehicle carrier. This time, the truck was equipped with a higher wattage radio transceiver than the first one, which the Foundation hoped would be enough to maintain communication throughout the anomaly. At a kilometer from beyond the boundary, the D-Classes departed the vehicle and were asked to remove their protective suits. They experienced no anomalous effects from exposure to the gas, but medical telemetry showed that one of the D-Classes was having difficulty breathing. The duo reported the same flat, featureless terrain the first vehicle's recording had captured. When radio interference occurred again, the Foundation pulled the vehicle back, and the two D-Classes were recovered safely, with no abnormal effects occurring as a result of being exposed to the gas. Still, there was no indication of what was actually occurring in Daleport. It was only that lifeless gray horizon and the Foundation wanted answers. A third expedition was carried out, this time manned by mobile task force operatives equipped with all of the latest gear, as well as several large vehicles. The vehicles split up, but communications quickly pointed out differences between the team's surroundings. One spotted an upward incline, while the others only saw the same terrain as before. Minutes later, the incline team reported that they were going down an incline. The team that hadn't seen the incline reported that they were now seeing it, and they were following the other vehicle downwards. Another team noticed red and blue patterns in the sky, while voices on the radios began speaking in an unknown language. After minutes of radio interference, the Foundation picked up the sound of a firefight, 
with mobile task force operatives giving wildly varying descriptions of the attacking forces. Whatever was happening was incomprehensible, and for whatever reason, the Foundation was entirely unable to communicate through their radios. After around 30 minutes of noise, an unknown voice gave a mysterious, gibberish-filled message to the Foundation. It's a little silly to hear, but there's certainly some strange undertones within. The voice said, It was clear that something had taken over the town of Daleport, and that this mysterious voice, while threatening sounding, was apparently protecting the people inside. It mentioned that the Foundation's men were in safe hands, and that evil had been summoned to the town. The Foundation didn't know what to make of the message, or if they could trust the entity that made it, but they didn't have much of a choice. They attempted to send more unmanned operations into the town, but they were unable to reach their destination somehow always winding up back where they started shortly after departing. After a week and a half of fruitless expeditions and no new information, the gas blocking the town of Daleport dissipated completely, leaving the town accessible and able to be explored fully by the Foundation. A containment crew fully set up a perimeter around the area, with secure cameras and an entire facility on the outskirts of Daleport, named Area 37, to oversee and support the Foundation's research efforts inside the town which was now officially categorized as SCP-1936. With the gas now dissipated, the Foundation began to investigate the anomalous effects left in its wake. The town itself was altered, with buildings physically differing from their previous states, and a large portion of them having become topologically inconsistent. There were rooms that would appear bigger or smaller than they should be, with some growing so small after they had been entered that they trapped occupants inside and prevented them from moving, resulting in a number of unretrievable Foundation personnel becoming stuck and lost inside the anomaly forever. Other doors would lead to different locations at different times of the day, or corridors that led to multiple locations at the same time, despite only leading to one. These difficult-to-describe spatial anomalies were so dangerous and unpredictable that the Foundation forbade any exploration into SCP-1936 without explicit authorization. But while the town itself was affected, what about the people inside it? The normal people who were caught up in the anomalous fate of Daleport. What happened to them? The Foundation was unsure, and while no survivors were found within the town itself, a large number of human remains of Daleport citizens were recovered during the exploration efforts. Most of these remains demonstrated anomalous properties, presumably gained as a result of the devastating anomalous disaster that plagued the town a week prior. Some of the remains the Foundation recovered were incredibly strange, such as a smear of entrails found alongside a small plant that gave out a constant flame. The pile of viscera picked up radio transmissions from up to six miles away, with sound being created through vibration of tissues. Another was a torso embedded in the wall of a building. Slight movement of the torso was visible when investigating personnel spoke, and blood continually manifested in mid-air, 15 centimeters above the torso. 
On the main street of the town, several corpses were discovered, with their flesh, skin, and bone all removed from a circular portion of their foreheads. Skin and brain tissue surrounding their wounds had undergone severe charring. Outside of the public library, several floating torsos manifest at certain times each day, simulating the motions of running alongside the road. After three minutes, the torsos attempt to leave the road and fade out. A young woman's body floats steadily upwards when any force is applied to it, regardless of the force's direction. The body is currently suspended 57 meters above the ground, floating over Daleport. And these are just some of the strange anomalies found within SCP-1936. While it's unknown what happened to these civilians, their bodies were clearly affected by whatever occurred the week prior while the Foundation was unable to access the town of Daleport. Something in that strange, anomalous gas triggered a highly destructive event that had grave consequences for ordinary people, and the Foundation was none the wiser as to what it was. Still, they continued their search of the area, and over the next few weeks, they discovered a number of recovered materials from the wreckage and debris of SCP-1936. The first were a series of written documents composed by the town's previous inhabitants. These were recovered from laptops and journals, but read in that same nonsensical tone that the mysterious voice spoke in during the Mobile Task Force's expedition. One note said that the writer was running out of canned food, and that there was constant screaming coming from outside their house, and something trying to break into it. The note talked about the town's reverend, described as having too many spaces in him, who was walking past the writer's windows and ranting about total nonsense. The note also read that the writer was fearing that, as they put it, one of the big guys was coming their way, and that they could hear the pounding, constant sound of drums. But one note remains consistent, found in multiple locations throughout SCP-1936, predominantly in public toilets and stitched into the internal organs of the Daleport residents' bodies. It reads, I am so sorry that I could not save you. Signed, Pangloss. The Foundation had heard rumblings and rumors of the entity known as Pangloss, who was supposedly a god with a helpful affinity for humanity but there was no concrete evidence pointing towards the being's existence. Whatever happened in Daleport, was Pangloss trying to stop it? The message certainly reads that way. Surveillance footage from a gas station painted an even more terrifying picture. An ordinary gas station cashier was doing his job ringing out a customer's items when the window next to him smashed open and an impossible-looking tentacle-filled entity made its way into the building. The tentacle creature lashed out at the two of them, brutally murdering the customer with the force of the impact of its slippery, writhing appendage. The cashier hid behind the counter, but the footage shows the entity also making its way behind the counter, and the gruesome visual of blood splattering the walls behind the register as the entity quickly took the cashier's life. But then, mysteriously, an individual enters the gas station, wearing a bowler hat and a waistcoat. The footage distorts as they enter the shot, then their face is revealed. Instead of ordinary features, like a mouth or eyes, they have a triangle branded into their skin. The tentacle entity move back in fear of this well-dressed individual, clearly afraid of them. Then, a series of multi-jointed appendages burst forth from various points on the individual's body, and they lunge forward, attacking the tentacle entity. The footage cuts off there, with the individual throwing the tentacle creature through the wall of the gas station. Whoever this individual was, it was clear they didn't take kindly to the rampaging tentacle entity. Some Foundation researchers began to speculate that the individual was Pangloss themselves, who was trying to save Daleport as best they could, but there was obviously no way to be certain of the mysterious person's identity. More footage showed a car crash outside of a public library, which resulted in a spectral translucent entity breaking free from the broken lamppost that the vehicle collided into. The car's passengers immediately ran, but the ghost-like entity chased after them. This continues until the ghost emits a large blue shockwave of unknown energy, which passes over the people, turning them completely transparent and causing them to fade away. The Foundation recognized that it was another mysterious, surreal entity rampaging through Daleport. Clearly, whatever happened here was anything but normal. Another collection of footage, this time focusing around Daleport's town hall, depicted the building in complete ruin. The roof was collapsed, the front doors were missing, and the entire structure was toned in a blue-violet hue. 
In front of the building was a convoy of vehicles, civilian trucks and cars, as well as the ground vehicles of the mobile task force squads that went missing after they were sent into the anomaly. It was clear this footage took place shortly after the Foundation attempted to enter the gas surrounding Daleport, and lost connection with the task forces that were sent in. The footage shows the Foundation soldiers, as well as the civilians of the town, fighting against another strange-looking entity, this time shaped like a fractal structure. Eventually, they retreat into the Town Hall building, narrowly escaping from the strange creature and directly into a circular blue-violet vortex. After all the civilians and personnel have escaped, the phrase, Pangloss grants you sanctuary, is burned into the stonework above the Town Hall's entrance. It was this footage that gave the Foundation a better idea of what occurred in SCP-1936, though the strangeness of the visuals didn't clear much up. Whatever disaster happened in Daleport, whatever resulted in these absurd, hostile entities being unleashed upon the town, was actively combated by Pangloss, the deity who was trying its best to move civilians to safety. But one question remained. If Pangloss was transporting civilians to safety, where did they wind up? Why did the Foundation not discover any survivors inside Daleport? Well, their answer came a few weeks later, when in a shocking turn of events, 94 live civilians and nearly all of the missing Foundation personnel manifested inside the Area 37 facility. Pangloss's emergency escape method worked, and the civilians were confirmed alive and without harm. It's not very often that missing persons are actually recovered in the Foundation's line of work, so hats off to Pangloss for managing to do some good in this horrifying situation. Interviews with the recovered individuals indicated that they all suffered memory loss regarding the events of Daleport, so unfortunately there was no new information to be gained from their recovery. But inside the anomaly, Foundation expedition teams uncovered more documents and pieces of evidence, this time referring to a cult named the Victory Society which the Foundation began to believe was the cause of the mysterious gas arriving over Daleport and the town's destruction. Little is known about the Victory Society, but it is believed to be a religious organization that was localized to Daleport. One note recovered from the body of a Victory Society member was a list of things that the cult needed, which included a strange and ridiculous combination of items, including two trout, a bottle of milk, beetles, ice, dead bodies, human eyes, and assorted souls. In the margins of the note, there were more personal thoughts, which the writer lamented the difficulty in acquiring some of the objects. Another note was found on the inside of the book, this time detailing a great religious battle between gods and entities that the Foundation had never heard of. Once again, it was written in that lofty, nonsensical tone, detailing an all-encompassing mist that would descend upon the world which would prevent those from entering the location the text described as the place where an event known as the Awakening would occur. If this text was to be believed, Daleport was the center of a battle between incredibly powerful extra-dimensional anomalous entities, who clashed together with little regard for the residents of the town. It seemed that Pangloss, the entity who saved the civilians, was just trying their best to move as many people as they could to safety away from the havoc of the surreal battleground that Daleport was becoming. More documents, this time from the Victory Society's reverend leader, detailed the cult performing a ritual. Again and again, the reverend stated in his notes that the ritual was for, in his words, the good of everybody, and that the victor would walk from the rubbles of man and restore clarity to those who remain. The notes also included a transcription of a speech given by the Reverend, in which he addressed the Victory Society cult with haunting premonitions of what would come. His voice painted a harrowing picture. Brothers and sisters, we come together to bid farewell today. It has been an honor to work with you all. I could not have hoped for a better group with which to secure the future of mankind. From the dawn of time, terrible impossibilities have spawned from the darkness between stars, not hating life, simply being indifferent to it. We are as ants to these abominations, these demented gods. They are so far above us that we are but insects. Accordingly, we shall look as such. In order to gain the forgiveness and favor of the gods, we must learn to know our place before them. Each of these things seeks dominion over the laws of reality itself, imposing the nature of their twisted existence upon stars and planets and people. The only answer to this threat? 
These gods must be destroyed. The slate wiped clean. We could not do this by no means, no. But we cannot allow these things to exist. A kingdom cannot have a billion kings. We cannot kill the gods, no. Only a god can kill a god. We will bring them here and bind them. Bind them until their bloodlust is satiated, until all but one is dead. Always a single god remains the victor, who returns to whence they came as the only god remaining. And with that, the mystery of Daleport was solved. The Victory Society called sought to wage war between the gods of the universe, until one victorious being would emerge. The town of Daleport was used as a battleground with all of the anomalous effects occurring as a result of the combat between these terrifyingly destructive entities. And if you're familiar with the deities that go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the SCP Foundation, you know these guys aren't a joke. The Scarlet King and his legions of devilish followers, the almighty broken god, and the mysterious benevolent Serpent of the Library are just some of the powerful religious entities the Foundation has researched and cataloged. And if what came to Daleport was anywhere near as powerful as those examples, it's a wonder the rest of the world is still here after the fact. Another piece of surveillance footage taken from in front of a church in Daleport Center depicts these violent deities in combat with one another. Beings of massive size and incomprehensible shape battling with one another in an ordinary suburban town. The Victory Society's goal may have been incomprehensible and difficult to understand, but the Foundation will never forget what happened in the town of Daleport, and the destruction these impossible entities caused. But a single question remains. We know that Pangloss transported some survivors from the scene, but what was the result of the battle? What happened? The Victory Society mentioned that a single entity would emerge victorious from the battle, but who was it? Which god was so terrifying? so powerful that it slaughtered the others and crowned itself king amongst the anomalous pantheon. Perhaps some questions are better left unanswered. Now go watch SCP-001 The Scarlet King and SCP-2217 Hammer and Anvil for more terrifying destructive deities from SCP Explained.